The eyes of all creatures wait upon God, and he gives them their food in due season. Beloved, we are come together in the presence of Almighty God and of the whole company of heaven to offer unto him through our Lord Jesus Christ our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to make confession of our sins, to pray as well for others as for ourselves, that we may know more truly the greatness of God's love and show forth in our lives the fruits of his grace, and to ask on behalf of all such things as their well-being doth require. Wherefore, in silence, let us remember God's presence with us now. O God, our Father, we have sinned against thee in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved thee with all our heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. Have mercy upon us, we beseech thee. Cleanse us from our sins, and help us to overcome our faults. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Almighty and Merciful Lord grant unto us pardon and remission of all our sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome back to the Queen's College Virtual Chapel. Tonight we return to our creation justice season as we continue to explore the relationship between human beings and the rest of the animal world. Traditionally, scripture and creation have been described as the two books of God through which he reveals himself to us. So to lead us in this reflection tonight, we're joined by biblical scholar Professor Richard Borkham. Richard is best known as a New Testament scholar. He was Professor of New Testament Studies at the University of St Andrews and has argued persuasively for the value of the Gospels as eyewitness testimonies to Jesus. But in the past 10 years in particular, he has been focusing on what the Bible might have to say about our relationship with the natural world. His sermon tonight is entitled Adam and the Animal. Let us pray. O Lord, who for our sake didst fast 40 days and 40 nights, Give us grace to use such abstinence that, our flesh being subdued to the Spirit, we may ever obey thy godly motions in righteousness and true holiness, to thy honour and glory, who livest and reignest with the Father and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. The first lesson is from Genesis. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, It is not good for a man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all of the wild animals, and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was his name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with the flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now the bone of my bones and the flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she has taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife, and they become one flesh. Here ends the first lesson.
The second lesson is from the Gospel according to Mark, the first chapter. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Here ends the second lesson. I speak in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I wonder how well you remember the first few weeks of the first lockdown in the spring of last year. It does seem a long time ago now, but I think for many people that early period of lockdown has a special place in our memories. It was very different from even the present time of, of severe restrictions. Someone called it the big pause because there was practically no road traffic and very little human noise. Our familiar neighbourhood suddenly felt very different. I remember taking a walk along a road I would not normally take for a walk because there's no footpath and there's lots of traffic. 
but I felt like I was walking back in time along a country lane in the days before motorised vehicles. What everyone remarked on at that time was the bird song. There was so much of it and so much louder. People discussed why it should be. Were the birds actually singing more loudly? Or were more of them moving into our streets and gardens now that humans weren't around so much? Or was it just that we were hearing them so much better without all the human noise? The truth turned out to be that yes, we were hearing them better, but the birds were actually singing less loudly. To make themselves heard to other birds, they didn't need to sing as loudly as they used to. But what the absence of traffic noise did for us was we could hear them at a greater distance. So we were hearing them better and further away. That helps to explain how it was that so many people felt closer to the natural world. Among all the difficulties of lockdown, one thing that many people agreed was a positive experience was a fresh appreciation of the natural, natural world around us. People took their daily exercise outdoors, in green spaces with birdsong, in parks, or if they were lucky, in woods and fields. Some of the most unlikely people took up gardening, and people found that nature is consoling and healing. We know that instinctively, but lockdown gave a lot of people a fresh awareness of it. We need the other creatures who share our world with us. Not just for utilitarian reasons, but because in some very deep sense we belong with them. We cannot be ourselves without them. We could have learned that from Genesis. Once we realised that those early chapters of Genesis were never meant to be history, then they have so much to give us. They're parables designed to tell us who we really are as creatures of our creator God and in relation to God's other creatures. So let's go in imagination back to the Garden of Eden in its pristine state before things started to go wrong. God created Adam from the soil of the earth and the first thing God did next was to plant an orchard for Adam to live in. Not a garden really in our sense but a woodland with plenty of fruit trees from which Adam could eat. Genesis says every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The trees were for feeding us, but they were also meant to delight us with their beauty. God meant humans to live with trees. And we now know that's even more the case than we might have thought in the past. Life on this planet couldn't survive without trees that soak up carbon dioxide and provide environments for any number of species. Trees are our best friends. But for centuries we've been cutting them down, clearing the forests to make way for cultivation, which in the past we did need to do. But we got into the way of thinking that forests are not much use to us, and we went on clearing them when we no longer needed to do, to do so. And now, because we've become so good at destruction, we are deforesting the planet on an epic scale. If Adam and Eve had been allowed to stay in the forest of Eden after they got to think they knew better than God, there probably wouldn't have been much of it left. Only very late in the day have we woken up to our existential need for trees and started some reforesting. But it cannot compete with the, with the daily destruction of the rainforests or the wildfires that every year now seem to rage on an unprecedented scale through the forests of Australia, California, Siberia. Then God created the animals. And that's the story we heard in our first reading. It has two sides to it. 
from one point of view the message is that the animals could not provide the partner that Adam needed, a partner of his own species. Adam needed an Eve, or Eve needed an Adam. It's not a story that privileges the male. Uh, you could tell it the other way around if you wanted and it wouldn't make any difference. You could say God first created Eve and it turns out that Eve needs an Adam. Either way, humans need other humans. But the other side of the story is this. Adam gives names to all the animals. Some of the commentaries will tell you this is an assertion of authority or mastery over the animals. But there's really no evidence that naming had that sort of significance. What scientists nowadays do when they discover an unknown species and, and they give it a name, a long Latin name, they're not asserting mastery over it, they're recognising it, they're acknowledging it as having a place in our world, a place on the human map of the world. When parents name a child, and that's the most common kind of naming that happens in the Bible, they're not asserting authority over it, they're recognising it as a person who needs a name to be known by in the human world. So Adam, the first taxonomist, recognises all the other species that have a place in his world. We shouldn't imagine that this naming was quick and arbitrary. To name an animal, Adam needed to ponder, to get to know the animal, to think of a name that would suit it. He's getting to know his neighbours and friends, all the creatures God has made to live with him in this beautiful and life-sustaining woodland. And naming them is surely giving them a permanent place in the world that he knows. He's certainly not expecting them to go extinct any time soon. When Adam names the first pair of northern white rhinos, he would surely be appalled to know that now there are only two of them left in the world. Those two survivors are mother and daughter. You might have seen them in David Attenborough's film Extinction. It was one of the most moving and sad episodes in the film. The pause the pandemic brought to many of our lives may have made us more aware of the natural world around us, but we need also to know that that natural world is disappearing at an alarming rate, even in our own localities. Had I really been able to walk back in time along that country lane, I would have walked into a farmed landscape far more hospitable to wildlife than today. Even the species we observed on our lockdown, lockdown walks are mostly in decline and the species we don't notice much, like insects essential to the life support system we are part of, are also in decline. Worldwide, as we all know, the rate of extinction of species and plants and animals is staggering. There's a natural rate of extinction that happens without human intervention, slowly enough for new species to evolve. And it's something like one species per million species a year. Now the annual rate is hundreds of times that, perhaps thousands of times. And the ways we are destroying God's creation are many and various the worst of them is habitat loss. What Genesis tells us is that we were meant, we were not meant to be the destroyers of the earth that we have become. We were meant to be partners with the trees. We were meant to give recognition and space to other species. In conclusion, I just want to draw your attention to something in our gospel reading just three words of it. After his baptism, Jesus goes out into the wilderness 
And before beginning his ministry in the world, the human world, he went into the non-human world, the spaces inhospitable to humans, where humans had not yet encroached. And what we mostly remember in Lent, of course, are the temptations that Jesus faced and overcame in the wilderness. But maybe this Lent we could pay a little bit of attention to one little phrase in Mark's very brief account of that time. He says that Jesus was with the wild animals. There's no hint of hostility there. Some of them could be dangerous. Others could be frightened of humans. But Jesus is peaceably with them, like Adam in the Garden of Eden. Maybe he spoke the names that Adam had given them, reaffirmed the human relationship with them. Let's think about Jesus with the wild animals this Lent.
let us pray. For all the animal kingdom, that in the decisions we make which affect the health and future of the planet we share, we may learn to hear and speak for those our fellow creatures who cannot speak for themselves. For all biologists, zoologists and others in this college and university who honour your creation by sharing in Adam's act of knowing and naming nature. That our knowledge may lead us not into a sense of mastery, but a greater appreciation of our own ignorance in the face of your infinite and intricate work. And for all who wrongly seek to silence such study in the name of God, that they may have faith to trust that you are revealed in all your works and glorified in all truth. For a holy Lent, as in our fasting and other disciplines we are brought closer to our own animal natures and limitations and learn to appreciate the basic necessities of life. That whatever disciplines of body or spirit we may undertake, or simply in the daily circumstances of our lives, you may use these weeks to draw us closer to you and to give us each whatever blessings or chastisements may be most profitable to us. And as we begin Fair Trade Fortnight, that we may also grow in appreciation of the ways in which our consumption connects us in interdependence with others across the globe, and that we may eat with grateful hearts and with mindfulness of the power our choices can have in the lives of others. For this nation, and especially all members of the College, as we await further announcements about the lockdown tomorrow. Almighty and everlasting God, who hatest nothing that thou hast made and dost forgive the sins of all them that are penitent, create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of thee the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Many thanks to Richard for his sermon tonight, and to all who contributed to this service. Our Creation Justice Speaker Series continues on Tuesday evenings. This week's speaker is Dr Jennifer Eggert, who will be presenting an Islamic perspective on environment and sustainability. That talk will be available to view live only at 5pm on Tuesday the 23rd of February. If you're not a member of Queen's, please do sign up online to receive invitations to all the events. Let us pray. Christ, give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Mm -hmm.